it's my pleasure to give uh, this dinner talk to you today. My name is Romy Amaro, and I'm a professor of chemistry and biochemistry at the University of California, San Diego. Um, actually, my parents live not too far away from here, so I was able to uh, sort of combine giving this talk with um, with visiting them, which is very, very nice on top of being, uh, being able to be here with you today. So I'm going to spend the next 40 minutes or so, I'm gonna aim for about 40 minutes, telling you about the work that we've been doing using extreme scale computing, um, both on the Blue Waters architecture as well as the various uh, DOE machines as well. And um, so the main focus of what we're trying to do really is to try to understand protein dynamics in more realistic cellular environments and to do that essentially through modeling and computing. So um, just I'm going to take a quick poll to get a feel for sort of who I'm talking to since I, I don't, I haven't been able to read all of your CVs. So how many of you or are any of you working in the field of like biophysics or molecular biophysics? One, like a small group, how many, um, I guess in more like astrophysics, a, f a few, okay. Um, are people here from finance or are we mostly in like the hard and physical sciences? Mostly from the sciences, okay. Okay, all right, in any case, so, um, uh, all right, so I'll just go ahead and get started, okay. So uh, I've been really excited uh, for many years to, uh, to develop a lab to create my own sort of research group that f studies or tries to figure out how to harness this great increase in compute power that we've had over the past uh, several decades. And so um, this uh, image will probably, so most of you in here from presumably are already familiar with um, you know, the really great advances that we've had over the past several decades. But I'd like to just reintroduce it just in case uh, you're not. So what I'm showing here is a plot of the available compute power to, um, and I'm being sort of very uh, uh, egocentric here. This is really compute power available to academic researchers, at least in the United States. Um, and uh, as a function of time. And you can see the first supercomputers came online in around the early 1990s. The, very f the first one that became accessible uh, to academic researchers was this HP 735 that had about 12 CPUs and that was really amazing. And using the techniques that I'm gonna tell you about today, mostly all atom explicitly solvated molecular dynamics simulations, we were able to study systems that were on the order of a single protein, so a small globular protein, uh, and that had, when fully solvated, about 10,000 atoms, and we were able to explore the dynamics of these systems on the order of hundreds of picoseconds. Now, from a biological standpoint, uh, hundreds of picoseconds is extremely short. Uh, so we're typically interested in much longer time scales. But that, at the time, of course, was state of the art and was awesome. And as I'm sure all of you know, every four to five years since then, we've increased our compute power by an order of magnitude. And commensurate with this increase in compute power, we've been able to increase the size and the complexity of the systems that are under investigation using these approaches. So we've gone from looking at single proteins to um, membrane-bound ion channels to looking at these super large, pretty large molecular machines like ATP, ATPase. Um, and then the ribosome, and I'll tell you a bit today about our work to simulate at the atomic level the influenza virus, which has multiple uh, hundreds of millions of atoms. And then not only is the size and complexity of the systems increasing, but also the time scales that we can access are, um, are becoming you know, much broader. And for, again, for biology, we really want to get out into the uh, milliseconds to seconds to sort of organismal level type uh, time scales, and so uh, today we can access on, routinely on the order of uh, tens to hundreds of microseconds um, uh, using, using these machines. So in any case, um, I would say it's not only been the increase in compute power, but of course also um, really in the past, well really hitting the sciences I think in the past five years or so has been um, a, a deeper appreciation for data science 
and uh, data science technologies, workflows, et cetera, because when you are trying to do computing at scale, you quickly realize that the bash script that you have, you know, needs to, um, maybe needs a little bit more oomph. Right, and so the other thing that we're very excited about is, okay, not only computing, um, uh, not only the computing power, not only the data science, but also just data in general. And so I will give, um, uh, I'll talk more about the types of data that we're particularly interested to explore. Um, I'll get into more details later. But it's really the convergence of all of these that uh, myself and many others really argue or uh, sort of, I think, agree that um, this is where the real research breakthroughs are going to occur, really at the intersection or at the interface of observational and simulation science, right? So, you know, real-time data monitoring and then modeling on top of that um, in a way where there's feedback between, you know, where you might want to go with the experiment based on the simulation and so forth. And I think we're still moving towards developing approaches that can be fully integrative um, and powerful at scale. Um, but that's certainly where things are going. And so these types of approaches are going to be enormously important for addressing some of the most uh, challenging or the biggest challenges that we face uh, as, as, a, as a sort of a, you know, humanity really. So that would be things like looking at climate change, trying to understand exactly what's going on um, in terms of the chemistry of the environment, for example. Um, in terms of developing uh, new sustainable energy sources, so looking at the fields of energy and materials, and then of course um, also the development of, of novel therapeutics in biology and medicine. And this is really where I'll focus most of my talk today. Uh, we do also do some work in atmospheric chemistry that's very exciting and funded by the NSF Center uh, for aerosol impacts on chemistry of the environment, but I won't, I won't have time to go into that today. Okay, so the bulk of uh, what we like to do, as I mentioned, and I'll show you, um, I will show you a couple of, equa of equations. I will say I work very hard to take most of the equations out of my talks, um, but, and also trying to appreciate that this is a dinner talk, and presumably you guys have been, uh, you're getting sort of tired at this point, um, but I will tell you that um, the easiest way to think about the, the, what, we, what we're doing with extreme computing is, um, is to think of it as a computational microscope. And the idea here is really that we can use the power of computing and, and algorithms to gain new and never before seen views into the inner workings of uh, molecular machines. And so um, you can see the wiggling and jiggling of the atoms here. I'll talk a bit more about that. But that's really what we are fundamentally driving at for reasons I'll explain. And so we can do, we can sort of set up these different systems and explore a range of different biological questions or disease areas like influenza, cancer, chlamydia, and neglected diseases like trypanosomiasis. And we're interested to do this, uh, again, for reasons I'll explain, but mostly around the development and design of new therapeutics. So, um, uh, so just giving a little bit more detail to it, and again, I think this is probably the only equation I will actually show. Uh, for those of you um, uh, who aren't familiar with it, uh, we're, I'll be talking predominantly about molecular dynamic simulations. And one of the things that always fascinated me about this particular area of science was that it was this great combination right at the intersection of a whole bunch of different fields, right? It wasn't just um, one particular field, but we're combining chemistry, physics, math, software, and supercomputers um, to sort of, to really, um, to create the research environment that, uh, and the research tools that allow us to explore these systems in, de in detail. And so essentially all that we're doing is we take a structure of, for example, a single protein, which is some molecular machine typically that does something useful for us in the cell. And we, uh, experimentalists can take high resolution pictures, almost like Polaroid snapshots of these different proteins using um, various approaches. But the main one that we sort of rely on in the field is something called X-ray crystallography, which um, presumably many of you also are already familiar with, but that basically tells us the relative positions of the atoms in our structure. And so we basically then approximate our protein system at the level of 
uh, of the of its atoms. Okay, and so um, we don't worry about. I mean, we worry about it, but we don't um, include in this really. Uh, these are not electronic structure calculations. We basically are considering those atoms as, as hard spheres, and different atom types have different properties, and they have uh, then different forces with each other. And so we define this potential function here called U, which is relatively straightforward. Um, so every two atoms that are connected form a bond, and that has a term represented there. Every three atoms that are connected form an angle and has a term. Every four atoms are connected are called dihedrals. There's another term. And then we have our so-called non-bonded interactions. So um, this looks like our van der Waals potential here. So uh, you know, looking at how close the atoms can come. And then um, a very simple Coulombic term for electrostatics forces. That's basically all it is. And then all we're doing is integrating Newton's equation of motion, F equals MA, uh, over time. And so we start with one particular structure, the structure that, I mean, ideally we're starting from a high resolution crystal structure. Uh, so we have a known starting point. And then we integrate one time step and we get another structure. And we integrate another time step and we get another structure. And we do this integration millions and billions and now trillions of times. And we can build up a dynamical understanding of, of, our, of the atoms in our system. And here I'll just note that this delta t, this integration time step, is pretty short. It's limited to one to two femtoseconds, maybe four femtoseconds if you use some fancy tricks with hydrogen mass repartitioning, which I won't get into. Um, but this is, you know, limited, of course, by the physics of our system. And so the fastest motions, we can't really go too far beyond the fastest motions, otherwise we violate the physics and the thing explodes. So. Um, so again, this is sort of what inherently uh, sort of limits how long we can actually simulate. Okay, now I want to give you a couple examples. So, or one, I want to start with one example of why is this useful uh, for drug discovery. So. Some of you may have heard of P53. I don't know how many. But, well, we had a few biology types, but I think even even uh, people outside of specialists in biology probably had to at least um, study a little bit of biology, and you might have heard of p53. p53 is known as the guardian of the genome. It is a central tumor suppressor protein that basically becomes activated in response to cell damage or cell stress, which can come from things like breakage of your DNA, UV radiation, or any kind of, there's a large number of stressors that will activate this particular molecule. When this molecule is activated, it becomes what we call a transcription factor, which basically then transcribes um, a whole bunch of different genes related to program cell death or cell suicide. So what that means is that in a normal operating in normal operating conditions, the cell is it senses some damage. P53 turns on, and then basically tries to kill. In, you know, it will engage the um, the mechanisms that will cause the cell to die. But what happens in over 50% of human cancers is that P53 adopts what they call a point mutation. And it only takes one point mutation to essentially render it inactive. So in these cases, what happens is that you have, um, you have uh, now inactivated P53, so the cell is damaged, but P53 never gets the chance. It doesn't respond to that. It doesn't actually get activated, and so it doesn't upregulate these pathways, and these cells can proliferate like crazy and keep on living and so forth, and that's how you end up with massive tumor growth, or one of the ways, one of the reasons why, I mean, cancer, acknowledging, of course, that cancer is really complex. Um, but uh, one of the interesting things is that they, they know from tumor sequencing data sort of the, the histogram or the population or the percentages that they see different particular mutations. And so it sort of was puzzling why some mutations, and so I'm showing the mutations, the most common cancer mutations as little red balls here on the P53 protein structure. So the green ribbon diagram thing that you see there, that's a protein, <laughs> that's P53. And um, I'm showing just one small bit of P53. P53 actually has sort of other partners that it works with. 
but it's very interesting that it just takes one of these red sites to be mutated to something else in order for this molecule essentially to stop working. But I'm going to mention that one of the, another interesting feature of this molecule is that it can also adopt a secondary point mutation and actually activate itself again. And researchers don't exactly understand why this happens. Um, we are trying to understand how this happens. But basically, um, these are so-called rescue mutants because they are able to take the otherwise uh, mutated, now cancerous or inactivated p53 and sort of bring it back to life. OK. Um, now, a, a dream of cancer biologists has been, as you can imagine, to develop a small molecule drug that would bind to and reactivate p53 much in the way that those rescue mutations do. Okay, so turn it back on somehow, but with chemical matter. Um, and there were a lot of different groups and a lot of different companies who were working to try to uh, develop these drugs because um, uh, it would be uh, a major, um, well, it would lead to a tremendous amount of profit if it could be developed. Um, and along the way, there's, there's been a number of studies actually sort of showing that this is actually a very good target. And interestingly, there was a series of molecules. So after about two decades of study, there were a series of molecules, only about these uh, five molecules here, that were publicly disclosed to reactivate p53. And um, this work was published in 2009 by, some, uh, by uh, sort of a bunch of collaborative groups here. Um, they uh, sort of showed for the first time that p53 could be reactivated with uh, these molecules here. Um, and one of the things that's interesting from a chemical standpoint is that these drugs actually attach to the, to the p53 itself. But um, because of limitations of the experiment, they couldn't actually figure out where it was attaching exactly to, uh, to the p53 in order to activate it. So we started looking at... Um, we started looking at p53. And this is, uh, this is p53, subject to the molecular dynamics technique that I explained just a bit ago. And basically, what you're seeing here are just the wiggling and jiggling of the atoms, because that's what we see. That's the output. And you're actually watching a sort of a looping movie of about mm, 50 nanoseconds or so of dynamics. You're just watching it on. on repeat. But one of the things I just want to draw your attention to is, um, is sort of how mobile the protein is in general. I mean, you see a fair amount of wiggling and jiggling here. Um, and in particular, is this, this cysteine here. So that group with the yellow and the red and the white, that is a potential place where those drug molecules could attach. And what's interesting, especially in this area, is you can see how this cysteine is moving around. It's back. It's tucked back. It's exposing itself. There's pockets around it. Then they're gone. Then they're there. Um, we became very interested in this. Um, and so um, the thing that is uh, really, I guess, especially interesting to us is that if you look at all of the experimentally determined structures of this protein in, that are available publicly in the protein data bank, and now there's well over 100 of them, what you see is that around that particular cysteine that I highlighted before, which I unfortunately don't show you with the same coloring, but you can pretend like my yellow cursor is the sulfur of the cysteine, it always had that, this very particular configuration where that cysteine molecule was tucked, or um, residue was tucked back, and we say occluded from solvent. It was inaccessible. And there was just this really small opening where not even a water molecule could be accommodated. All hundred some of these structures. But you, we saw very, very quickly, even in dynamics that I mentioned, 50 nanoseconds, you can now run I don't know, it probably takes an hour on a single GPU at this point because of the advances in GPU computing. Um, we saw this open pocket and the dynamics that I showed you. So it's not just one open pocket, but it's real mobility there. So um, this was very, this became very interesting to us and our experimental colleagues. So we, we saw this new site open in the computational simulations, or as I like to refer to them as really, they're sort of computational experiments, is how we, we think about them. And then 
we used other approaches, also predictive, to assess how druggable that site is. I won't go into details about it, but we use something called FTMAP, which is the computational equivalent of like um, cocktail solvent crystallography. Um, and that it actually showed that those methods actually sh predicted that, okay, not only is this site there, but it's actually potentially druggable. And then we did small molecule docking into that site, and we saw that that site could accommodate a whole bunch of different uh, small, molecule, small molecules. And so, um, so, we ran, uh, so we ran the simulations, we got these new structures, we tried to fit different chemicals into this site, and then we passed about a dozen of these molecules that we predicted to bind well into this pocket. We passed those to our experimental collaborators. And they tested them a whole bunch of different ways, and they found dose-dependent rescue in, in mammalian cancer cells for this one compound I'm showing you here called stictic acid. And interestingly, we were able to show by mutational analysis that the compounds that had been disclosed in 2009 by that larger group of, of folks actually worked through um, their mechanism of action, uh, actually worked through that particular cysteine. Why that's cool is because that compound, those compounds actually have been moved on into clinical trials and are now actually being used in patients for some of the toughest cancers to treat. So we were able to basically explain how, using computing, we were able to explain how that worked. And we've now, I'm required to tell you, um, we've now um, significantly expanded the approach, and I'm a co-founder of a company out in La Jolla called Actavalon, which is really interested in developing small molecules for P53 reactivation for actual use in patients. We've developed multiple dozens of compounds that can reactivate um, not only, they can reactivate multiple different types of mutants and you know, be sort of more targeted towards particular mutants or be more broadly applicable. But what's cool about this is that um, it really showed that with a good computational model, we were able to, um, to discover more P53 reactivation compounds over the course of six months than the whole of the 20 years of research efforts combined previously. Uh, so we sort of like, we, I like to hold that out as an example of the kind of things you can do with, uh, you know, with computing, even um, that was using exceed computing at the time, but now I wanna, we're gonna stretch it a little bit further here, our thinking. So um, we can imagine that this is P53, um, it's not, it's a ribosome. But typically, when we are, when people like, in, mo in molecular biophysics, people like me, or computer-aided drug design folks, um, we are really concerned mostly with studying these molecular machines sort of in isolation. We take the crystal structure, we, we put a bunch of solvent around it, and we pretend, and we, we use these things called periodic boundary conditions. We engineer the thing, the whole experiment to have this infinitely dilute solution, essentially, of the protein in some box of water. Uh, but that is not actually, and sometimes that works. I mean, I showed you a nice example of it led to some models that were useful. But we like to imagine how useful it could be if instead of just studying the single protein in isolation, what we really want to do, we want to understand how these proteins are working in their actual realistic environments. Uh, and so this is, uh, th the complexity of biology is in some ways, to me, still astounding. Um, and it astounds many. Some of you may recognize this sort of art. This is a David Goodsell painting. Uh, he's at the Scripps Research Institute. Um, and uh, as artistic as this is, it's actually drawn uh, in sort of accurate relative proportion in terms of the stoichiometry and the size of the molecules and their approximate placement to the best of our scientific knowledge currently. But you can just get appreciation for just one sort of example of how complicated it could be in there. So, uh, you know, I think that um, the idea that we're gonna run or somehow simulate every atom in a cell uh, is enticing to some, crazy to most, I would say. Uh, you know, I think we, there will be people who try to do this, certainly. I think so, if someone will do it, you know, probably actually it won't be too long out from where we currently are. But, you know, what we really need are approaches that can bridge across scales, right? Because when we start to, um, 
when we, if we really want to understand sort of the emergent behavior of how these proteins are actually working in their in their complex environments, how they actually respond to a drug, and how that sort of changes all the way, uh, not just its local environment, but in the, in the cell and the community of cells and so forth, and how that actually affects the body and the disease in the human, all NM simulations, it's not, it's not gonna inform us about all, you know, every step of the process along the way, right? So um, what we are really, we've been keenly interested to do are to develop what we call multi-scale approaches that will allow us to take information that we have at one scale and somehow link it with the next scale. And if we do this for enough scales to the level that we're interested in, then we can, we can actually develop a really sort of coherent and integrated understanding of uh, these sort of fundamental mechanisms that are happening at a very sh uh, small time or short length scales and fast time scales, but understand how they propagate out to these longer time and length scales, right? So it really will allow us to address what are the molecular mechanisms underpinning disease. Uh, and, you know, I'll also say that people often ask, well, like, well, what's the point? Like, why do you really need to go through all this work? And for me, it always comes back to uh, the, the, the fact that I would be, and many others too, if we could, if we know this, this, all of this information across all of these scales, it gives us the ability to, or the potential ability to design chemical matter Right, that would allow us to manipulate very precisely these systems, uh, but in a way that we were able to understand sort of the, the sum of the behavior over time and space that we're actually interested in. So it could be potentially very powerful. So the, you know, in general, um, I guess the best way I can explain it is that we have very, I would say, pretty good predictive methods or approaches at each of these scales. For example, I just gave you one at the molecular and macromolecular scale. So here we're interested mainly spatial scale, uh, you know, the angstrom to nanometer scale, and time scales from the femtoseconds to microseconds. And, um, you know, we have methods, at the, so we have methods at the molecular and macromolecular. We have subcellular-based methods, solid-based methods, tissue methods, even met methods to look at sort of whole organ-type geometrical changes, for example, with uh, heart physiology. Um, but there are these, these so-called gaps in our ability to connect. Okay, so really understanding how those, all the many molecular players are actually driving the features at the subcellular and cellular and tissue levels. You know, how does it work? We have these gaps where we don't really understand, where we can make models of scales, but then actually connecting it back to the point where we can get all the details, it falls off. And so, you know, myself and many others are interested to really address the capabilities, the capability gaps, as we call them, so that we can essentially cross these scales. And, you know, we really think that doing so with computation, especially extreme scale computing, will give us unseen views into the inner workings of cells uh, at the molecular level. And so, um, you know, because I took a lot of the equations out of the talk today, uh, and because I can't possibly touch on all the scales that go from the molecular even to tissue, um, I just did want to do a little bit of shameless self-promotion and uh, point out this perspective that I published with a colleague, Adrian Mulholland um, in Bristol, um, that covered sort of the range of approaches actually all the way down to quantum mechanical appreciation or electronic structure calculations and how that could play out all the way through whole cell modeling. Um, and we do, you know, we sort of outlined it there. But really, we sort of try to present here that it's, it's again, as sort of, I've, as I stated earlier, that improved algorithms, ever more powerful computing architectures, and the accelerating growth of rich data sets are really what are going to drive uh, the development of these methods that are capable to actually bridge biological and chemical complexity uh, from the atom to the cell. And so, um, so how are we going to build up an understanding of what that single protein is doing, who its neighbors are, et cetera, uh, in silico? Well, we, of course, have to turn to experiment. And we're very excited about um, the really tremendous growth, as I mentioned at the beginning, of, uh, of data sets, of biomedical data in general, and there's many, many different types. We're particularly interested in structural data because what we really want to do 
uh, is try to use this data to build a, a 3D representation of, um, of, a, of an actual cell. We like to call these visible virtual cells. And to do that, again, um, we will be enabled to do this uh, with these new technologies that are now really uh, sort of in, in full force. Um, so I, I mentioned a little bit already x-ray crystallography. This is electron crystallography. This, at the smallest scales, will give us very high resolution images of essentially sort of sing those single proteins. Um, we can also use cryo-electron microscopy, or cryo-EM. I'm sure many of you have heard of this. They uh, won, the Nobel it won the Nobel Prize in, um, in 2017 for chemistry, uh, uh, some of the pioneers in that field. Um, and there's been really amazing advances in these so-called direct detector technologies, uh, which have now enabled the, um, these methods to reach sort of almost near atomic resolution, which is super exciting because a lot of the drug targets have been intractable to traditional crystallographic experiments, but now people are able to get views into what they actually look like using these new approaches. Um, so this gives us, in general, uh, a better appreciation of how these smaller subunits are actually coming together into their macromolecular complexes. Um, still in the sort of cryo modality, we also have cryo-electron tomography, and this has recently been combined in some very beautiful experiments using focused ion beam milling. So they can vitrify or freeze very fast these cells they, and then slice a very, very, very thin layer of the cell using this ion beam and then take images of that. And what you end up doing is understanding then how these macromolecular complexes are basically situated inside of their native environment. Very challenging to do, not very many data sets, but it's happening. And then there are different modalities outside of uh, uh, the sort of the cryo, um, the cryo modality using resin embedded samples or plastic, it is sort of they, they refer to it as sort of plastic imaging. Um, you can use something called serial section electron microscopy, which um, gives us, again, sort of more, a sort of a wider field view of what's happening in, in these cells. And then also things like serial block electron microscopy, which is actually where they can put a whole piece of tissue inside of one of these electron microscopes situated with an ultra microtome, and they can um, they can basically take a f the first image, use uh, a diamond knife, and now also I think they can do it using fib milling. Uh, they can shave off a very thin layer, image another uh, slice, shave off again, image. These microscopes will run for weeks at a time. They will generate enormous data sets that are have their own whole set of challenges trying to pick out or trace out or segment out what they're actually looking at. Um, uh, but in any case, this little this segment here of tissue, the routine data set is, has about 1.2 trillion pixels. It has about for on you know just approximate to give us a sense for just perspective here. There's hundreds of thousands of these single. Uh, these sort of single molecular counterparts inside these big inside these big sets of data. So we're very interested to actually use this. So uh, at the resource that um, I've been directing for a number of years, it's called the National Biomedical Computation Resource. It's an NIH P41 research uh, technology development resource. We've developed something called CellPack. And this is also in collaboration with Art Olson and Michelle Sanner and David Goodsell at, um, at the Scripps Research Institute. So you remember that picture that I showed you of, of that bacteria uh, with the ribosome and all the complexity that David Goodsell had drawn. Um, well, it turns out that um, this program here called CellPack was basically inspired by his imagery. And the idea was to create an automated platform that would t ingest all of the data that David's brain would normally ingest. And that data could be uh, protein structure, NMR structure, electron microscopy data sets. It could be um, tomography or fluorescence data. It would be proteomics data. 
because he would need to figure out exactly where these pro you know where these little pieces are, how many there are in every section, etc. Um, and uh, you can feed in, in fact, any type of input data that you want and create these different recipes that you can use to populate and ultimately describe the generation of essentially a static picture of your system. Okay, this could be the nucleus, it could be a bacterial cell, it could be whatever you want. It could be, um, it could be a, 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 a sea spray aerosol particle. Actually, we're doing that now on... Um, on some of these extreme computing machines, but I said I wasn't going to talk about it, so I'm going to stay focused. <laughs> so, so you can basically, s if you know, you can define then, okay, these are all my different interior ingredients. I know their structure in some cases. I know what their relative populations are. You can constrain these based on location. If you know it, you can easily encode that in. Um, you can do that for the interior component here, shown in, in green, and then you might do the same thing for the surface, and the surface would have, you know, in this very simple example, a different set of ingredients. And then using um, very fast gaming architectures like Unity, we're able to, CellPack can now run very quickly to generate not just one model, not just one three-dimensional model that satisfies all of your constraints, but actually an ensemble of models. And that's always been, and it still is, and it will be for some time. I mean, one of the real challenges to biology is the heterogeneity. Even if you have all of the same or roughly the same within some errors, uh, different, you know, uh, stoichiometries and uh, pieces of the, of the, you know, of the cell, um, even if you have that information, there's so many different ways to put it together. And it used to be that even creating just one image was so painstakingly difficult. But now with this program, it's, it's done in an automated fashion. And um, as I mentioned, you can then make these ensembles of models. So what we're interested to do is as not to make the pretty pictures, as much as pretty pictures are wonderful to have, especially when you're giving talks like this. Um, and they can be useful. They're more than a pretty picture when they help someone understand, you know, how crowded it is in a particular uh, in a particular environment, or you want to understand relative proportion uh, or location of species. But what we wanted to to do is connect this program that had really initially been developed for visualization to uh, to different types of physics-based simulation engines, so that we could then basically bring those to life. Oh my gosh, I'm s I'm going so slowly. So it's good that we started a little bit early. So we've built. Um, in order to do that, you do have to develop tools that allow the system to actually be simulated at the atomic level. So that means, for example, that we had to build, um, we had to build a tool that would uh, construct realistic all-atom lipid bilayers, but at the scale of, and what we were interested in was this influenza virus to start. Um, and there's a lot of work involved in that, because typically people in our field what they have done and what the vast majority of them still do, again, you have your single protein and you just make a planar slab of your membrane and then you, you work, you know, you just have that. So everything's been built for these single protein systems and we now want to do this at scale. Um, so the example that I have that I want to tell you about that we've been able to get up and running on these machines <laughs> involves um, influenza virus. So we've been very interested in many years for many years to study influenza uh, because it's a major, it still remains a major public health threat and in, um, in various sort of incantations of it. So we, st we took, uh, we developed a fully integrative model of influenza virus that combined high resolution crystallography of the different membrane uh, proteins and so forth in the membrane with cryoelectron tomography data from a terrific collaborator, Alistair Stephen, uh, who was at the NIH. Um, and we were able to build a fully atomic version of uh, the influenza outer envelope. And so, um, this movie is just sort of taking you through that. I'll, I'll show you here also. So this system that we built has approximately, where's my cursor? It's up there. Where is it? Oh, the system has, um, so I'm hiding all the water molecules. So this is explicitly solvated. 
Uh, it has about a little over 160 million atoms. And it has the patterning and density derived exactly as from the cryo cryoelectron tomography. So we place those proteins exactly where the, the experimental data told us to place them. Uh, the blue guys are uh, hemagglutinins. The red molecules are neuraminidases. And you saw the membrane there. And so this particle had about, uh, in terms of dimension, it's about, um, it's a, it's a cube of about 120 nanometers or so in dimension. And it has uh, on it, this, this virus has on it 236 copies of hemagglutinin and 120 copies of neuraminidase. So we have lots of data to work with. And then we ran um, all atom MD on this beast. And again, I'm hiding the water molecules. So you can see that we're like rotating and translating the virus itself, but you can also, if you look closely, you can see the wiggling and jiggling of the atoms there. That's the, those are the trajectory dynamics as predicted uh, from the all atom MD. And so we first ran this with a very small allocation on blue waters. And, um, you know, it was funny. I feel like I should say this. Here is the right place to do it. Um, you know, I would say that. Uh, just that whenever you are doing something that's sort of very different than what everybody else is doing, I think probably everybody in every field experiences this, it's very challenging. It's not always met with grand reception initially, right? Because uh, it's viewed as too high risk, for example. So it took us, it took us actually uh, quite, quite a while, I'd say two years, to actually be successful in even getting an allocation on these machines, even though we had the system fully built. And um, that was just essentially because uh, people were thinking, well, what are you going to learn from this? And um, so because the system is so huge, we were only able to simulate one copy of this system for about 120 nanoseconds, which again is really short in terms of biology. And it's especially short for a system of this size. But what I didn't tell you is that we had pre-equilibrated all of the different bits in our system. They had already been subjected to multiple microseconds of data. So we, uh, the equilibration of the system itself actually was accelerated in this case. But if you look at the first structure of the simulation and you overlap it with the last structure of the simulation, you don't see any huge rearrangements. You wouldn't expect to see any huge rearrangements in that short of a time scale. But what we didn't anticipate at the time, <coughs> excuse me, um, when we were first applying, but we later realized we could do, is that you know it's one thing, and we're continuing now with longer simulations on other machines, including the DOE machines. Um, We've been able to simulate out uh, to microsecond type time scales for these for various systems uh, of influenza with glycans and so forth. But even for this initial system where we had 120 nanoseconds of dynamics, recall that you know you have we have on this system many many copies of the the different proteins. So the purple guys are these hemagglutinins. We have 200 and some copies of that. And so this inspired us to use something that we call uh, Markov state model theory to actually extract long time scale dynamics from these systems. Um, now, one second, I'm going to do a sidebar here to Marta because I'm going really slowly. So should I skip this slide? OK. Um, the students are probably like, please let us go. <laughs> You're so tired. But I'm going to play this movie So, because um, I think more of you, you got, you're more technically oriented, so if I do that, will it start? Today, I'm going to tell you about Markov models. For Markov you, models are named after Andrei Markov, a Russian mathematician who was born in 1856 and died in 1922. Among other things, he studied Markov processes. What are Markov processes? A Markov process is a chain of events that is memoryless. That is, it is the assumption that the next event that will happen depends only on what is happening now, and not what happened previously. A simple example of a Markov process might be a person. We'll call her Romy. Let's say that Romy can travel between three different possible places. Work, home, and the Eiffel Tower. In this Markov model, each of these three locations is called a state. Now what we need is a series of transition probabilities. 
Transition probabilities tell us which state Romy is likely to travel to, given where she is. Let's assign a set of transition probabilities to each of the states. Every time Romy travels, we call that a transition event. In this model, if Romy is at home, she has a 0.5 chance of going to work, a 0.4 chance of staying at home, and a 0.1 chance of going to the Eiffel Tower. Notice that all of these transition probabilities sum together equal 1. All transition probabilities going out of a state should always sum to 1. How do we choose these numbers? Well, typically, we have to watch a process and count how many times a transition takes place. In our case, we have to watch Romy as she moves around. Let's say that we see Romy leave home ten times, and she goes to work five out of those ten times. This gives us a probability of 0.5 that if Romy is at home, she will go to work next. Once we have all these statistics, we can construct our Markov model. Typically, our transition probabilities are entered into a transition matrix. Notice that each of the columns of the matrix represents the state Romy came from, and each of the rows represents the state she is going to. Using this matrix, we can compute all sorts of useful quantities. So how do we use it? Well, first we need a starting probability vector that represents what we know about Romy's starting location. Speed it up because I know that we, thank you, because I know that I have been slow uh, or too, I've been a little slow to get going. So, um, so the deal is that we can use this different approach to the analysis, which is more statistics oriented, in order to uh, extract much more meaningful uh, metrics from the data sets than we, uh, than we had anticipated. So typically what you're interested to look at if you're thinking about a protein is that you, we might be interested to study the transition between it going from starting from an inactive state to some active state. And the way that we would do that, as uh, the narrator explained in that movie, might be to, um, so that it would, there would be different states it would get to, uh, it would sample along the way. We would start one protein and then we would watch it move. And we would have one long time dynamics and we would see the protein go from the inactive to the active state. But what we can do with Markov state models is actually treat each of the copies in that in our simulation sort of separately. So in our we basically deconstruct that big cell that sort of cell based system um, and we can then monitor how the transition probabilities uh, from you know, going out of and to each of the different states that we've constructed. And then we get all of these different transition probabilities. And why this is so cool is once we have this information, this allows us to define what we call these different metastable states. So this would be like the work and the home and the Eiffel Tower in the movie. And we can actually extract long time scale dynamics about the behavior of our system, even from short, from many short time scale simulations. And so, uh, again, just sort of recapping that, so we basically um, deconstructed this big system to treat each of these proteins independently, but they're sampling dynamics from within their crowded environment. So we then can appreciate really the, the dynamics of the protein, the internal dynamics of the protein itself, but actually in the context of the, in the cell, sort of more cell-like environment. And why we care about this is because we can actually use these different metastable states. We can, instead of just selecting what one open pocket looked like, like we did with the P53 example I told you about at the beginning, we can actually try to target particular states that we find to be stable, these so-called metastable states. And I'll just tell you um, again briefly that, of course, people are always interested in, well, how, and they always ask us, well, how does it compare these big simulations? It's such a pain to actually construct them and, um, and then simulate them. How does it compare to, uh, you know, the control experiment where you're just looking at the internal dynamics of the protein, but in the single sort of isolated version where it's dilute solutions? And so we did all the work to compare both. And what we found, so we, we were comparing the transition of one particular loop in um, 
the neuraminidase active site. I'll just show you here. So this neuraminidase is uh, one of the two drug tar well, it's actually the, one of the most important drug targets for influenza. It's the one that Tamiflu acts against. It's a sialidase molecule. So this 150 loop here has been known to exist in what they call the open state and the closed states. And we actually looked at sort of the, the, the dynamics or the transition for that loop to go from the open to closed and the closed to open in both the sing in single glycoprotein, so sort of dilute solution conditions, compared to our the whole sort of crowded environment in the viral coat. And interestingly, what we found is that actually the, pro the probabilities or the, um, the relative populations between the closed state and the open state are the same between the, the single copy simulations and the whole viral simulations. But what changes is actually the rate of transition between them. So it actually seems that the, the, the having the crowded environment actually accelerates the loop motion. And everything else is controlled for here. It's the same force field, same crystal structures, same everything, uh, same uh, binary for running the dynamics, uh, that it's actually somewhat accelerated uh, in this crowded environment. OK, and I won't, uh, well, I, I can tell you, let me just say one thing, and I'll be done in four minutes. Um, it's not only, as I mentioned, that we want to understand how every atom is wiggling and jiggling in these systems. Because as you get out to really big systems, you think, I don't care what that particular arginine is really doing. You know, I want to look at larger scale phenomena. Um, we can also then use these, the, the system building approaches that we've developed, we can now, we can use with various other types of physics-based simulation. One that we've connected it to already is Brownian dynamic simulations, which basically, um, the party is starting next door, which basically uh, looks at the rigid body diffusion of two molecules. So we can, for example, we can build multiple of these influenza viral structures and actually look to see how, for example, this molecule there, that's Tamiflu, that's a drug molecule, how it actually diffuses to the surface of the virus. And you can do this for antibodies. You can change the strain type that you have of the flu. But what it allows you to do is really understand very detailed interactions, but at a scale that is you know, meaningful uh, when you're looking at the diffusion of small molecules. And so we were able to do this in work that was published last year. We showed how we could build different versions of the flu. And one of the most pathogenic, so why we care about this, one of the most pathogenic, you might have heard of bird flu. So that is a version of the flu or avian influenza that is not very transmissible among people. Some, unfortunately, some people have actually contracted avian flu. And when it does get into a human, it has at least a 50% a 50 chance of being fatal to that person. Um, this is in contrast to, for example, the swine flu, which probably everybody in this room has contracted and has antibodies against because it was that 2009 pandemic. It circulated around this H1N1 that circulated around the globe in about three months. That was highly transmissible, but it wasn't very virulent. It didn't result, you know, half of the people who caught it didn't die. Um, so there's always this, you know, this sort of fear that uh, these very virulent strains, that they just need to make one or two mutations and they're going to be like super transmissible among the people. Um, and that actually is a realistic, it can be a realistic threat, as we have already seen with other strains, for example, like in the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic. Um, but so what we can do with these types of novel structural models is, is look at particular features that these different strains have. And so um, I'll just draw your attention here. So the, the image on the left is the H1N1 swine flu, which we've all been infected with. And the image here on the right is actually the avian flu. And one of the things that's interesting is in these, in this particular, in these, in the avian strains, the neuraminidase has a stalk deletion. So it's this green guy here, which looks like a short little broccoli. You can see this is what it is in the highly transmissible strain. It's, it's, just, it's higher. And in the, in the not transmissible but virulent strain, it's lower. And so we made some predictions about uh, the rate of association 
of, uh, of essentially the virus with different uh, receptors that are on the host cells and, um, and sort of showed that the interplay between, all th between three different sites where they could bind actually might be a driving factor in transmissibility. Okay, and so I just wanted to close by saying that um, with uh, all of these extreme, com with these different extreme computing platforms that we now have available, um, you know, there's the system that I told you about today where we're really utilizing these machines to look at the dynamics of these ever complex systems. Uh, you know, there's many systems that we want to look at and we're already thinking about and building, in fact, the next set of systems that will drive the scale of size and complexity even further. What I'm showing here is an all atom uh, model or a molecular model of the actin gel inside a dendritic spine where we're now using data from the serial section electron microscopy, <coughs> trying to understand exactly what's happening in spine growth, which is important for a bunch of different neuro uh, neurobiology uh, type applications. But so um, what I really want to drive at here is these, these are now up to a micron in scale uh, in particular dimension. And so we're sort of, I think biophysics in general is ready f to take it, uh, you know, to, to, to consume, like many fields, the great resources that are coming now to us from these uh, exascale or extreme computing platforms. Okay. Whew, with that, I just want to thank, I have a terrific group uh, in La Jolla, as I mentioned, and um, a significant amount of funding for the tool development and the system development actually comes from the National Institutes of Health, but we rely tremendously on, uh, on the, the computing architectures, extreme and sort of normal, the exceed uh, platforms that are uh, generated by the NSF and also uh, by the DOE. Uh, and so, and then the last thing I want to mention, these are the students, Jacob, Lorenzo, Sarah, Lane, uh, who I would say are very brave, uh, who've been the ones that have really been working on these systems in my group, these large scale systems. Um, and I say they're brave because as many of you will experience, if you haven't already experienced, when you sort of take that step from using sort of traditional modalities of computing and analysis and so forth, and you go to that extreme level, you break every tool you have available to you. Um, you break, you fill every disk, you have every sysadmin chasing you down and texting you because now that you just froze the whole machine. Anyway, these are the students who are dealing with all of that as they, um, as they complete their research. And I'd like to thank all of you for your attention. <laughs>